many of our stage four patients have gotten into long remissions up to two or three years at a time. And there's others who have just continued on and on and on. We have a couple patients more than 20 years who were stage four at diagnosis. So again, that word stage four is problematic because people will look it up and think they suddenly know what's going to happen next and you don't. Welcome to Target Cancer Podcast. My name is Dr. Sanjay Janeja. I'm a hematologist, medical oncologist in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, also known as the Onc Doc on social media, where we try to educate on rare cancer types, how cancer type stuff works, and what we're doing in the future, as well as today, or what we hope to see in everyday community practice when it relates to cancer therapy. Today, I'm super excited to have Dr. Paul Kent, who is a specialist in pediatrics with oncology, has trained at some elite places. I think it was Mayo. I saw, was it Harvard prior to that? Yes. Yes, Harvard. And um, and now he basically dedicates all of his time to fibrofiders or fibrolamellar carcinoma. And we're going to talk about this because it's not as common or nearly as common as some of the cancers in, you know, everyday households or families. But at the same time, it's something that really deserves attention because it's often diagnosed late and there's not a lot of kind of studies and literature on it. And it generally affects populations that are younger, unlike a lot of the cancers we're used to that kind of happen more often with age. So with all that said, Dr. Kent, uh, it's great to have you. And um, basically, I was wondering what what made you gravitate towards fibrolamellar carcinoma specifically with all the pediatric oncology uh, and hematology that you do? Yeah, good, great question. So two main reasons. Number one, I had an amazing a patient who came to me, a young adult who w- was trying to find someone who would treat her cancer, and that she had gone to both pediatric and adult oncologists, and what they offered were completely different, and and neither was a treatment that she wanted to do. She had found her own, um, done her own research, and found a treatment that had been successful in Israel and was being tried at MD Anderson. I said I'd be willing to try it. Uh, that was the first thing. And the second thing is the fact that it was this young adult population, young adults. The as we call them in pediatrics, AYA, adolescent, young adults, are a group of patients that are very poorly served. They, uh, your survival is less if you're 21 than if you're 60 uh, for the same cancer and way less than if you were 17. So something happens to young adults and adolescents where they don't get the care they deserve. And, we, and that's always been a focus of mine is the young adult, adult population. No doubt. And I think it's for m- multiple reasons, one, something maybe about the genetics of the tumor itself may be, you know, more aggressive or or really depends on the disease type. One of the important things is when we talk about, you know, liver cancer, for example, a lot of times my patients in the community believe they'll say they had lung cancer and then they had liver cancer and then bone cancer. But that's obviously very different from a process that is primarily originated in that organ. So a lot of times if you're listening and you have a cancer that's originated in one place. Sometimes it takes verification, but if you have multiple spots in the liver, that is a primary cancer that is cloned and kind of traveled and gone somewhere else, unfortunately, involving another organ, otherwise metastasized. Here, a lot of people, if they dig deeper, they say, oh, I know liver cancers, it's hepatocellular you know, carcinoma, which we hear about a lot with, with uh, cirrhotic processes or, or liver disease. Then we have cholangiocarcinoma, which is pop- it really seems to be popping up a lot more. I don't know if it's the diagnostic awareness, if it's diet and food and if it's all that stuff combined. But then now we're talking about a different category and that's fibrolamellar carcinoma, which does generally, or forgive me if it's all the time, originate in the liver, but it's of a different tissue type in the liver. Is that correct? Probably. We don't know which tissue type it is, but you bring up a good point. What we know for sure is it absolutely is not hepatocellular carcinoma, but that's one of the major reasons we started this foundation is the misconception that it is somehow related to HCC, which, you know, there's it's the eighth most common cancer in the world. And this is a cancer that, that occurs in 100 patients a year in the entire United States. It's ungodly rare. Most physicians have never seen it, including cancer physicians have never seen it in their entire career. So, yes, it, it, we don't know the cell of origin. It's probably biliary and probably closely, closely related to cholangiocarcinoma, but it always starts in the liver. That's correct. And, you know, with, at least with HCC, there's usually some degree of underlying, you know, pathology. So if you have hemochromatosis and you have a ton of, you know, iron deposition, which causes cirrhosis or alcoholic cirrhosis or hepatitis cirrhosis uh, related cirrhosis. But here, I presume that fibrolamellar does not require liver pathology underlying beforehand, or is it something that needs to be no, you're like, correct. is there a really correct? There's never underlying pathology. And that's another common 
yeah. misconception and one of the problems with research is because the research will often lump this together with HCC and the two problems there is three problems. Number one, it's not HCC. Number two, those are 85% of the time people with uh, unhealthy livers with cirrhosis and alcoholism and hepatitis and everything else. And number th uh, three, they're almost always elderly and deconditioned. So everything you're, you're doing with them is very fragile. You're very careful. You're so worried about liver function and all of that. And that's none of that applies to to fibrolamellar, and consequently, the patients are mistreated and undertreated. No doubt. And one thing that we've talked about quite often is, you know, there's different ways of looking at what a survival is for a tissue type. One of the reasons that lung cancer is so, you know, thought of as, as a low survival compared to how long it's been around and how much attention it has is it's two balloon sacs basically in your chest. And if you don't get lucky, you know, which is a sensitive term, but have it in a place where you're either coughing up blood or, or have some reason to know about it, it, you don't have nerve endings. And that's what I keep trying to kind of say on this podcast. You don't really have nerve endings all throughout and inside of your liver, just like your lungs and pancreatic is its own outlier. It, it's, you know, a stubborn disease for many reasons. It hijacks your immune cells sometimes and shields itself and the immune system. But in addition to several of those reasons, one is because it's often not symptomatic unless, again, sensitively, you know, you're lucky and you get it to block a duct that then makes your bilirubin go up and you happen to be in that one place. That's almost, you know, a godsend. Whereas with, with liver disease or liver cancers, you know, you usually don't have a single place of, of blockage like you can right where it dumps out into the pancreas. And you have to have, I assume, multiple spots or something big enough to cause an issue. I don't want anyone hearing this to say, oh, I have abdominal pain, must be fibrolamellar malignancy. But that's part of the biggest challenge, correct, is even on your lab work, unless you have something that's, you know, a more high burden disease, you're not going to see that up uptick in the clogged plumbing like bilirubin and have these, you know, liver enzymes kind of leaking out. That, would you say that is one of the biggest challenges is being able to get it when it's a colony small enough to either cut out liberally with, you know, margins that are all negative? Would that change significantly the the prognosis or is it just very stubborn in general? No, with its well, those rates? are two two excellent questions and two different questions. So it is diagnosed very late. The, the majority of patients are already stage four. And I have 150 patients, I think 135 of them are stage four, and most of the remainder are stage three with a few stage ones in there. And the stage ones cancers were picked up completely through serendipity. Someone had an appendicitis and they went in and they happened to see the mass. One is a medical student and he was learning how to use an ultrasound and his partner uh, who was doing the, uh, work uh, practice at ultrasound found this mass. And another one, a kid was going to donate, uh, a young man was going to donate a kidney to his sister and they did a workup and they found the mass. So those patients were lucky in the sense that it was picked up early. Uh, furthermore, and, and I don't know if you, uh, Sanjay, if you have medical students, uh, nursing students too, uh, uh, who listen to your podcast, hopefully you do, but they very often have right shoulder pain. So you ask them why you get right shoulder pain. They go to the orthopedist. They're, they, they're worked out for, uh, because they're athletes for pitching and all sorts of problems. And of course, what it really is, is irritation of the diaphragm referred to the right shoulder. And we've had plenty of people that sometimes for two years being followed by, you know, uh, sports medicine and everything else. Your AST, ALT, bilirubin, all of your so-called liver function tests are normal. In fact, when they're not normal, I'm already suspicious that you have the wrong disease. Right. Would you also piggyback the right shoulder pain with possible, you know, occurrence of hiccups that are just really refractory yeah. and, and not yeah. occurring or not <laughs> cause as be. much of the anything that as you as you know and and, and but we'll have to ask the students to uh, write in on the comments or something. <laughs> Anything that irritates the diaphragm uh, can present as shoulder pain, and hiccups is one example: spleen, liver, gallbladder, any of those things. So, yeah. Well, I remember my wife when I was an intern. She's a year ahead of me. She's also an oncologist. Was you know saying like, yeah, you know, refractory hiccups out of nowhere. Like you got to look for more occult disease. And I was like, why? And she's like, you know, I still remember that that process of the anatomical relationship that goes up there. And it's something if you're listening. Again, you know, there is a connection there. So if you're just looking, you know, locally in one area, but you're sure something is new, then there are places that things radiate. And that's generally because they're just not as specific as the nerve endings on your fingertips. Like they didn't need to be over, you know, hundreds and thousands of years on the uh, on the insides to have something so localizing um, is, is, you know, one of the many thoughts. But to that point about tests, and I don't know if you know the answer to this, but I get by far the biggest question is, is you know, about gallery and these tests that are more so like, 
not a way to say, a lot of people say, should I or should I not? And I have a lot of my professional friends that aren't doctors. And I'm like, I mean, you could, if you have no reason, what it doesn't mean anything a year from now or two years from now. It's not like your probability. Those tests are looking for active, you know, basically mutational uh, findings in the blueprints of cancers to say, hey, it looks like you have something that's usually not in normal cells. Do you know if fibrolamellar is, and I doubt it, to be honest, in that kind of 49, 56, you know, cancer list of a lot of these more popularized, you know, free circulating tumor DNA, uh, like your testing? We do circulating DNA for our cancers, for sure. But you have to look for it. And so there is a mutation that is uh, classic and 100% pathognomonic, uh, as, as you know, pathognomonic meaning that it's an exact, uh, you can only have it if you have this mutation. If you don't have this mutation, you don't have it. So it's a 100% match that can be found in the blood, but you'd have to look for it. And there's no, um, some labs will pick it up. Occasionally, Foundation One or one of those will will pick it up, but usually you have to ask for it. What is that pathognomonic mutation? Uh, yeah, it's called a DNAJB1 dash P R K A C A. <laughs> oh wow, that's <laughs> it's a fusion. A fusion, it's a fusion of two uh, genes uh, and chromosome nineteen after a four hundred thousand kilobyte deletion, and this fusion then is both uh, necessary and sufficient to drive the cancer. We part in this interruption real quick. If you're enjoying this podcast or find it valuable for what we discuss and the education and how people see and think about cancer in general, we would very much appreciate a like, subscribe, and especially a share so we can bring that information as maximally and broadly as possible. Thank you so much for listening. So that brings me to my next question, that if we have something that is almost a uh, an absolute necessary step uh, for this malignancy. And we love the reason we're in a painful pun way called target cancer is we love to talk about things that we can isolate or distill down that doesn't have to do with the replication cycle and cytotoxic chemos. Number one, can we undo that translocation like we do sometimes with CRISPR or, or you know, basically rewriting the, the kind of coding, which I think I know the answer to that. And then number two, that very long thing that, you know, hopefully you'll come up with a, a name that's just much, you know, hopefully a pun that's easy to target. Are we looking at how we can dismantle that process? And is it is it a process that helps it proliferate, helps it escape getting blown up? Or is it just mostly like a relationship that doesn't necessarily enable it as a powerful tool, but more so just lay the landscape and then it does what it does. It's all three. So it's both a marker as a way to correctly identify it. So the pathologist needs to send out a DNA study or as a fish study, as we call it. And you know what that is, of course. Uh, so both diagnostic, yes, but it also drives the cancer. Um, and it's also um, not only, it's also necessary for the cancer to stay alive. So all three are true. If, they, if you eliminate it or part of it, the cancer dies. Without its presence, the cancer doesn't grow. Um, and it, so, the, yes, we have this a beautiful targeted that makes a, a chimera protein, which, as you know, the word chimera means, you know, a lion and an eagle that have uh, are created that look like the same animal. So we call this a chimera protein. It's two proteins that shouldn't be together that are fused together. And that's what drives this entire cancer. We would love to find a way to exactly block it as was done with CML in Gleevec and N equals one. We've been waiting decades to have the second example of that because it's such a great example and people have been waiting and we haven't been successful. We have that one fabulous example. Um, and then the other way around is because it creates a protein and it creates a um, stretch of DNA that's not normal using that as a vaccine because hopefully okay. that will be recognized now as, and that's being tried at Johns Hopkins, be recognized as an abnormal protein that shouldn't be present or an abnormal stretch of DNA that shouldn't be pr uh, present. And as you know, vaccines are very commonly use a bit of protein uh, from the virus or bacteria or a bit of DNA or RNA from the virus or protein as a way to stimulate your immune system to say, oh, this is not me. This is not normal. I'm going to recognize it, kill it, attack it. And much more importantly than that, although I'm glad it recognizes it, kills it, attack it, but much more important, I'm going to remember it. I'm going to remember it so that I have immunity. So that's the holy grail there. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, hundred percent. You know, we get very excited uh, when we can isolate something that that we know is a is a you know pathologic or, or or arrow in the quill for a cancer. And I've gotten a lot of questions about vaccines, especially as it relates to breast cancer and the HER two. And you know, 
some of the anxiety about that is we know we have HER2 receptors in other places. Um, that's why you have this whole echoes with trastuzumab because, you know, you have HER2 receptors there. We're also very humbled in medicine because then we add another target for HER2 and the heart stuff doesn't get any worse, this diarrhea. But the point is that that is a protein that if you get, you know, overexcited or too hype, as the kids say, then you can kind of cause collateral damage in places that you're not trying to attack it. Whereas what you're saying is this is a you know, a protein that really your body doesn't have to worry about having anywhere else. So if you could, you know, similar to CAR T in a way where you're, where you bring out the lymphocytes to take a feature of the lymphoma cells. And I say CAR T because it's doing so well and then inject it back and say, okay, now, Hey, smart, smart Marines go snipe it. You're actually getting to construct this inside your body. You just say, this is the thing, go find it. And much like we did with the M protein, uh, when it came to COVID vaccine, you know, it's, it's, it, it's the concept that, hey, this is the kind of thing that looks a little sketchy and I would love for you to go kill it. But then what happens? You get variations to the exact protein. Uh, and then that's why you get all these you know variants that come up. But in this case, hopefully it can be on a more macro level to where you can, you know, you can attack it with in that manner. So, OK, very interesting, very exciting. That mutation. Now, that's the sequence that is the protein name similar to that or is that the protein <laughs> yeah. itself i'll put it in the chat it's got the same terrible name we need to come up with a uh we need to come up with a new uh name don't we so yes yeah we're gonna okay. need to come up with a new name for this <laughs> i'm saying yeah i'm gonna have to i'm gonna have to overlay yeah. that one <laughs> so what else what else do, can you tell me about you know anything relating to that or even inside your field, you know, like if we could go back to when you were saying that this, I've never heard that statistic, the 21 year old, I assume apples to apples for the same cancer would do worse than the 60 year old. And worse than the 17 year old. Yes. There's an entire section of the uh, National Cancer Institute devoted to AYA, adolescents, young adults. And uh, the outcomes for adolescents and young adults are worse today than they were in 1975. Now, the, the outcomes for people who are my age, 50 and 60, are much better. And the outcomes for children are dramatically better. I mean, the idea that we're going to cure cancer in pediatrics is not far-fetched. The vast majority of children are cured, not, not remission, not, you know, in any code word. They are truly cured, 90%. But for adolescents and young adults, it's gone backwards. And, and um the reason almost certainly is money because that's what it always is. These are the poor, most poorly insured. Uh, there's already been improvement with Obamacare because it went up to age 26. Uh, but these are people who are very poorly insured uh, instead of being on their parents' insurance or being wealthy enough to have good insurance. Um, but it's a very dramatic thing. And for every disease that, that has been compared, exactly the same, apples to apples. There's no difference. Um, if you're 19 and you go to a pediatric oncologist and you're covered by your your uh, your parents' insurance, your survival's 90%, like it should be. And if you're 19 and you're not carried, covered by your parents' insurance, you go to adult oncologist or community hospital, your cure rate's about 30%. Especially oh for my leukemia. goodness. Very and dramatic. The, and that's like the main reason. Well, it's just yeah. The, and it's enrollment the... on clinical trials is tiny. In the pediatric world, it's about 90%. In the adult world, it's about 5%. That's a big reason as well. Well, yeah. hopefully that's. But this is yeah, this, in this some odd well way. known. I mean, they they've the NIH has an entire uh, subset, the National Cancer Institute, just devoted to adolescents and young adults, and the St. Baldrick Society. You've ever heard of them? We shave our head you to raise it? money. Yeah, yeah, that's one of their big. That's one of their big missions is to get more kids enrolled and treated, young adults tr- enrolled and treated on clinical trials, and get to the best possible treatments. So. Yeah, no, hundred percent, and you know, I heard. I remember back in med school, like a few theories, at least for some of the, you know, blood malignancies was that you're, there were theories, but that oncologists are comfortable hitting harder, you know, uh, a pediatric age for these like malignant uh, blood cancers because, you know, the tolerance and the litigation and all that stuff is less of a concern as a child's life. All these little finicky things, but by far that makes the most sense. Um, I can't wait to be retired and to be able to just say it more bluntly because I always have to but I've learned that myself is the same thing is that a lot of our barriers are just because you have to see what is incentivized, which really is a big underserving for rare disease in general. I mean, it's like we're actually so cognizant of the money factor in industry or anything in the world. It's not that, it's not that the healthcare is any different or, 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 you know, 
sinister. It's just that it is an industry like everything else. So now there's funding to hopefully incentivize people to do rare diseases because if it's not because these people need help, it's like, okay, here's how you can get some extra allocation just to, to figure it out. Um, but, you know, I would say, you know, when I speak too, is like accepting it is what it is. That's how you find solution. Yeah, I can change, you know, those facts. So, um, okay, very interesting. And as far as we know, um, is there anything in the bracket spectrums or or anything that could kind of predispose or increase your chance of having this uh, mutation as a pure No, there's one insanely rare condition for an insanely rare disease. So we're starting with this insanely rare disease, maybe 100 cases, maybe 200, because there are people who are not being diagnosed correctly in the entire United States. And then there's a syndrome called uh, Carney syndrome, which I've never seen that uh, has this part, at least as a part of the same mutation where it's more common. But no, um, like most cancers of young people, there is no cause. It certainly isn't from the environment. It isn't from any exposures and, and so on. None of that is, that paradigm never is true in pediatric cancers. So, Including even like Lepromini, TP53. Lepromini, like, you're at like, risk for everything. So probably someone out there with Lepromini <laughs> has fibrolamellar, but uh, if beyond the big five, just about any cancer is going to be more common. Yeah. So Or RB1 yeah. or something. So yeah. I imagine those as well, although it's never been reported, it would not surprise me. <laughs> so with fibrofighters specifically, because I thought it was just so noble, like I said, for many reasons, the retirement to be able to really funnel the energy on democratizing care. That's kind of what I've gravitated to a lot, you know, for personal reasons. Um, what is it that makes you like super passionate about it? I mean, I'm sure number one, it's like a good thing for an underserved group of people, right? And they're generally younger. Um, but if there's anything exciting you want to share about it, I'd love to hear more. I love for all the cancer organizations and foundations and stuff. I love your insignia. It's almost like a Gryffindor kind of like sword. And, and it's something that, you know, hopefully gets people really rallied up to try exactly. to Exactly. It's thing. supposed to show a chimera animal that is part beast and part different things that are being killed. So yeah, I mean, the average age is 19 and my children are 19, 19, 18, 15, and 13. This is my wheelhouse. I mean, these are the kids who need, uh, should, and be treated aggressively as possible. There's the, the concept of, uh, you're stage four and you have metastasis. We're going to use palliation. We're going to, we're going to think about hospice and so on is absolutely ridiculous. These are young, healthy people who can and will handle intense treatment and they have a whole life ahead of them. So I think, um, one of the main two, some of the main steps are to convince people that there are treatments that work. We've developed a number of systemic treatments that work. Um, that you can and should push hard for a cure right from the start. You don't accept that, oh, this is stage four. I've seen this before. Because first of all, you haven't seen it before. You're comparing it to HCC. And number two, and again, I know this is probably unfair to my adult colleagues, but you're used to taking care of weak people. And you'd have no idea how strong kids are. These are 19-year-olds. They have no comorbidities, nothing. This is literally the strongest they bet they will and have been in their entire life. There's nothing they can't handle. So stop being a baby and holding their chemo because their white count is, you know, 1.0 or their platelets are 45. I mean, for God's sake, they're not at risk for right. any of all that stuff that you see in your old cirrhotic, diabetic, overweight, heart failure, smoking uh, patients. Or or they're not all like that, I know, but yeah. half of them are. So. <laughs> no, it's true. And that was the point I was making earlier. That's true. But they're so, that, that they're like... so strong and so healthy. They deserve it. They go for it and you need to go for it. So that's what we want. No, hundred percent. And that was the, that was the point. I think I, I remember from med school with the AI analysis was we're just like, oh, you were scared and right. And you just need to hit them because it's at the end of the day, life saving. Oftentimes I had this conversation about a Hodgkin's patient actually not too long ago, you know, LFTs are a little off. I'm like, this is Hodgkin's that we have to like treat through, you know, but so to that point, HCC, right. Obviously in the last couple of years has been treated more, much more with like TKIs and immunotherapy and I mean, the indications from now I'm going to feel old when I graduated in residency or fellowship, there was like, it was a big deal that, you know, something that replaced serafinib, I, I believe. Um, and now I don't even think about that, right? I'm using these oral uh, agents that are, that are tyrosine kinase inhibitors plus by the immunotherapy, immunotherapy by itself. Is the treatment similar? It sounded like you said it's pretty intense or is it back to the... Well, 
sarcoma, you know, all kind of regimens, TCF, and I don't know. No, good question. So it doesn't. There, there's really nothing about HCC that is that you can transfer over to fibrolamellar. So atezolizumab unfortunately never works. A serafinib never works, nor does any monotherapy. But combination therapy using immunotherapy does. So for example, uh, we have four systemic therapies that we use commonly. Uh, one is using gemcitabine, oxaloplatinum, levantinib. The other is using nivo, uh, nivolumab with gemcitabine, uh, linvantinib. Uh, and the third one, 5-FU interferon with nivolumab. So they're all combinations, first of all, at least three drugs. There's also supplements that are beneficial. Um, and so what's interesting to me, to me, all of these therapies are very tolerable. But I know sometimes the adult world, they feel like they're not. But of course, we have a different concept in pediatrics. All our patients are bald. All our patients have portocasts. All our patients are in the hospital for weeks at a time. They never do chemo outpatient because it's too intense. So our concept of intense and side effects is so different. And if this is all outpatient. They don't lose their hair. Yes, it has side effects, but the, anyone, they can certainly handle it. And, you know, who's going to push their patient to do it and what patient is going to accept it? And that the answer to that is the patient who has hope and the doctor who has hope. When they say, you're stage four, we'll try this, I don't know if it'll work, then of course it's not gonna work because already your doctor doesn't believe in it, so now you're not gonna believe in it. And now when they come in with a side effect of neuropathy, you're gonna say, let's lower your dose. Instead of, let's try Lyrica, let's try Elevil, let's try acupuncture, let's do this, let's do that, but under no, under no circumstances are we gonna lower your dose. You're not getting a chemo vacation or any of this. I mean. You know, we're trying to cure you here. You got to, you, and, and most patients are like, bring it on. Let's do it. Unless you go into, in there with an attitude of, ah, I don't really know. It doesn't look good and stage four and we'll do the best we can. And in, in quality of life, quality of life means going to college, getting married, having kids and watching them grow up. It doesn't mean I feel crappy and barfed. Okay. We need to get away from that. <laughs> Again, that might be old people. Fine. Have your quality of life, skip a day, spend the day. It's a nice day in the park with your dog. But for us, quality of life means being alive in one year, five years, 10 years. And our patients do. We've already seen a remarkable difference in how much longer these patients survive. You said year survival, even in a stage four setting, potentially. Many years. If you use no, many years. Many years. So now uh, many of our stage four patients have gotten into long remissions up to two or three years at a time. And there's others who have just continued on and on and on. We have a couple patients more than 20 years who were stage four at diagnosis. So again, that word stage four is problematic because people will look it up and think they suddenly know what's going to happen next and you don't. Some of these cancers can be turned into a chronic disease. They, it, it'll grow. There's a slow version of this cancer that grows very slowly and it just grows slowly and it will return from time to time. And sometimes you need a surgery or an, ab or an ablation. But meanwhile, you live your life. And you grow up and you have kids. Yeah, so, no, 100%. You know. I mean, it sounds kind of like, you know, I'm just, I could be wrong, but I'm thinking of like a primary peritoneal mesothelioma. Like some of them are very yep. aggressive. Some often their times are too too far advanced, but you kind of debulk, you sort of right. reduce, right. you know. I don't think the data is as good nearly for some kind of adjuvant treatments just yet, but it's a similar concept. Yep. Like you just don't let it ride, especially if it's, you know, you can keep an, a vital obstruction from happening. Yep. Like, you go for it, you know? And patients so. can be kept alive for and a then, very, very long time. We're thinking of a patient of mine who's 54, but she was diagnosed when she was in her 20s, and she's getting ready for her daughter's wedding and her other kids, and she had her kids after she was diagnosed. She didn't, and all along, she's been incurable. She's been stage four, but things will pop up, and sometimes we'll do ablation, sometimes we'll do radiation, sometimes we'll do a course of chemo. We do different things through the years, and you just keep going. And to me, that's no different than having bad diabetes or having lupus. And yeah, that sucks having diabetes or lupus, but you don't walk in the room and say, listen, I got to be honest with you, you're incurable. But they do that with all of my patients. And instead of saying, you know what, let me be honest with you, this is tough. You know, but there are people who live long lives with diabetes and with lupus and with heart failure and with HIV. And we don't make it their meeting focus of, oh my gosh, you're incurable. But we do that all the time on oncology. And once you take that hope away, then, then you're in trouble. So don't do that. I mean, I'll tell you, this is a whole different conversation. I've never really brought it up publicly, but then you get into this issue of basically hearing two different things from doctors. Because when I'm admitting and I know the statistics and I know the trade-off of what could happen 
and I know my patient very well. But then if they're hearing now from different white coats, like, you know, will you stage four and do you really want to go through this? And is it, you know, that's a whole nother, I think, conversation or podcast, but I think it almost disrupts, like, I mean, it does, it's it just statistically has to disrupt a potentially life altering therapy. If, you know, if the, if the either criticism or the, or the conflicting, you know, feedback is, is strong enough, but so, that's, that's something that's on the side for me to tackle one day, but yeah, no, I would. I believe that hope is medicine. I believe that love is medicine. I believe that listening is medicine, and I believe that humility is medicine. And all of those are medicine, and they all make a difference. So, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah, no, I agree. And that's you have to think about too. The patient, if you know, we all got to pass away when they pass away, and then their spouse and everything. Where are they in their heart? If they were somebody that said, "I want to try for my husband or wife or whatever," and then they understand, like. I, it's almost robbing them of saying, well, I'm not going to give you that opportunity. I mean, unless it's absolutely absurd, but you know, it, that's a whole different conversation, but, but, but it's a, it's one that is this pretty important in my opinion. Can I tell you about our tour board? Please. I would love that. Yeah. So we, since this is such a rare cancer, we started an international tumor board. Now, of course, you know what a tumor board is. So I don't know if your listeners do. Uh, so a tumor board, as you know, is required at every cancer institution in most hospitals, even community hospitals will have a tumor board. And, and for the patient, people who are listening, you review every new diagnosis and usually relapses as well of cancer. And you have a group of experts who review it, look at the scans or surgeons or oncologists, radiation oncologists, hopefully patient advocates, all talking about what's best for the patient. So what we do this is an international tumor board, meaning that there are people from all over the world, well, not all over the world, but we have Germany, uh, United Kingdom, uh, Australia, and U.S., but many places around the U.S. and many powerful institutions who are reviewing this, and all of them have expertise in fibrolamellar. So the reason this is so different than the tumor board at your hospital is everyone in the room has expertise in this rare disease, number one. Number two, that's all we're talking about, nothing else. And we only do three cases, and you're welcome to come uh, every Thursday. We have so many cases, we do three, four cases every Thursday from around the world, and then give our recommendations back to the home team. The home team comes as well on and on Zoom. And that way they get the benefit of um, many, many, you know, really hundreds of years of experience of patient years, if you say it that way, of the people in the room on this rare condition. See, and not that, the bias of just one institution. Yeah. Exactly. And that was the biggest point is like, you know, if you're a, an aware oncologist, you know where certain institutions biases are to like, they want to be the data makers. They want to trump NCCN and everything to say, we have the best survivals in X, Y, Z. Meanwhile, they want to do the best. Like one center might just be pancreatic and they truly believe, I don't want to give away too much, but like the chemo radiation, all this, but it's not that they, they just want to be the experts in that one subdivision. I just had this conversation today and it was about, uh, uh, sorry, it was last, last week or two. And it was about amyloid. And I'm like, I'm having to send them to a center that does amyloid more just so we can have the expert opinion of a multifocal disease, the pulmonologist, the, I, you know, the, um, the hemonc and, and a lot of these things take a multidisciplinary approach. One way that we democratize care is again, recognizing that it's not necessarily an all bad thing, but they exist. How do we democratize tumor boards and expert opinion without the bias of an institution or a location or anything else? I, I love that you all are doing that. Um, and how would one, if somebody has this, how do they kind of put their name in the, I don't want to call it a Yo, hat. In the to, queue. To yeah, absolutely. You just contact me or Tom directly or go through the website. We have our cell phone there. We're happy to talk to you. It's no easy as can be. We will put you on our tumor board as soon as we uh, found a way to view your images. Obviously, you could send your images to us on CD. You could also uh, upload them through uh, programs that share imaging in a HIPAA protected way. Uh, and option three is you could have someone from your home institution who is good enough who can drive drive the screen, share their screen, and go and go through the images in a way that's 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 good enough. Like a, a surgeon or radiologist usually is someone good enough to do that, or interventional radiologist to show all the necessary images, and then we can discuss the case. Yeah, that's incredible. Do you know any uh, any other like kind of again just democratized tumor boards and other disease sites? Yeah, there was one in Ewing sarcoma. I remember uh, reading about. That's the only one I'm aware of that does this. That's incredible. Uh, I do remember I 
lingering question. So I've had a few guests, uh, you know, Dr. Thomas Siegfried at Pitt and Dr. Jason Fong, the cancer, uh, the, the obesity code, cancer code, et cetera, that have talked a lot about, well, one, mitochondrial injury was Dr. Siegfried, but also about this low glycemic principle or uh, ketogenesis and kind of what the metabolism of certain tumor types do. When I hear what you're describing as far as the translocation in the protein, I feel like you know, with no disrespect to anyone or anything, that is maybe less of an effective manner because you actually have a, a malignant, almost like venom from Spider-Man kind of protein that's kind of sounding like it's it's propagating this process uh, in a stubborn way. But is there any evidence for Siddhartha Mukherjee of Emperor Maladies was talking about certain like amino acids being identified as the pro- preliminary or the, or the, you know, significant drivers for certain pancreatic cancers. Yes. Is there anything that you could eliminate so that seems like it may What you're talking about, obviously, and I know you know, but for your audience, is metabolom- metabolomics. I sometimes have trouble saying it. Metabolism omics. <laughs> Meta- and in this case, right. what you're talking in, in the example would be glutamine. So this cancer is addicted to glutamine is the word, phrase we use. And so having a, a low glutamine diet is not an easy thing to do, it turns out. But there are medicines that can block the glutamine pathway, for example. And to some degree, ketogenesis, ketogenic diet helps. Uh, and there are many other interventions that we have used uh, that are p- related to metabolism. For example, metformin uh, is a drug that we often recommend. And our data, if we have a uh, assay for testing drug sensitivity, shows sensitivity and more importantly, synergy with lots of other with lots of other standard uh, chemotherapy agents, for example. So, and metformin, again, not for you, obviously, but for the people listening, as, as you know, is this, you know, everyone knows someone taking metformin, I promise you. <laughs> you know, that's how common it is, the type 2 diabetes drug, right? So, <laughs> right. And you said it somehow possibly sensitizes your response to these antibiotic oh, no question. treatments? No question. It definitely does. We have, um, we, we have an assay that's done at the Nagurney Institute in California through UCLA, and they, we send them fresh tumor samples. It's, this is always a struggle, but we've been able to pull it off. It must arrive on their branch fresh and alive within 24 hours, so it has to be taken right out of the patient in the OR, put in the special media, FedExed overnight and all that. Anyway, once you have it, they, they study combinations. And as I said earlier, we have never really... Uh, with maybe one exception, found a single agent that will kill the cancer. So every time you see a single agent study for any type of cancer, uh, my, in my opinion, all you're doing is providing data for the company uh, and you're helping the world. But the idea that this is going to help you is just ridiculous. It just, it doesn't. So, but sure enough, combinations work and we find synergy. And one of the common synergies is metformin with linvantinib is a classic one, for example. I've, I've, I've heard this many, several times. I've talked to companies doing it both in avatars of fruit flies where they will kind of add metformin to a cocktail to see what it does and also if the diabetes part matters. And then I've also, um, yeah, I heard it in different contexts. What is that What is that company you said where you oh, yeah. ship it off and it's check called, for the sensitivity? It's uh, uh, And I certainly could send you, we, we just- I know, I know multiple people more At ASCO, we just got a uh, paster, a poper, poster paper uh, accepted for publication coming up here in July in Chicago. Uh, or in June, I guess, in Chicago, and also oh, a couple exciting. posters with our uh, combination therapies and also one with the circulating tumor DNA. So to a circulating tumor DNA, when it's so-called tumor-informed, um, has been very helpful for us. No doubt. Well, this was very encouraging, inspiring. I love that you say things the way they need to be said. I think in general, medicine is an, just, we're counterproductively overcautious about the practice acting like it's homogenous and we know it's not and we know there's so many different variables and facets and factors and it's okay to talk about some of them that are getting rusty and need replacement and you seem like a man that's doing it so i appreciate it i can't wait to dig a little deeper and kind of hopefully you have some some of your time allocated in the elements that are more holistic and philosophical about the practice itself because i do think that is something that no one can fight unless you're in medicine and healthcare and usually a physician to even start the conversation. Like patients know it's like, hey, something's screwed up about this, that, and the other, but you just got to be in it to know it. And uh, and if you don't, if you're not speaking up about it, I'm on my poke and probe when I kind of pull it off the shelf to be able to, to tackle. But is there anything else you'd like to share before uh, we wrap up? I, no. I mean, other than thank you so much for in, including us and helping us get the 
get the word out. And, um, you know, everyone wants a doctor who says, um, I don't know, but I'm willing to learn. And this is, this is a classic example yes. of saying, I mean, that's me. I still have lots to learn. And I saw my first case of this disease six years ago and I was, you know, uh, 55, I guess, and I had never seen it before. So you're never too late to learn. And then, you, and then, uh, you got, you're always, there's always more and, you, and, and we have to work together. And that's always been a, a challenge to get everyone to work together and be willing to share their data before it's published and be willing to share their experience before it's published. And that's another uh, issue I have where people are not willing to uh, help the world because of their own personal research or their own uh, data collection. So let's, there's someone out there it, who needs you. It's crazy. I mean, I think that's why we both, yeah, I think that's why we both identified or, or found synergy with x is because they really are truly saying like, how can we help the people that need help, number one, that are in areas that you can't access the care. Number two, all this stuff is exists out there that's only going to help people now, today, tomorrow, our parents, our children. And what you're saying with that, you know, if, if somebody listening doesn't quite pick up is we are keeping it insulated and having smaller populations of study, retrospectively, prospectively, whatever, basically to say, like, I can query this data first. If you were to pull it all together, you would have far more, like, you know, a sharpened pencil to be able to make these kind of observations and theories and everything. But that is not, and I repeat, anyone listening, that is not how it is right now. But there are companies that are trying to do it. They're nonprofits, whatever it may, may be the case. Uh, Corey Painter, she, they, I, I thought this was so noble. Everything that they're finding in the angiosarcoma, the relationships they're finding, they're just making it public. And they're saying, we, we, we're, for some reason, we're seeing a trend on resistance for this thing in angiosarc and not this one. They're not trying to, you know, sell it. They're like, we just want, we want to give people the information we have that we've amassed because of our foundation. And if you can then tunnel in your own little thing, then go do it. We prefer it to be public. And I love that you all yeah, are we you share know, supportive our, of that. My so. Dropbox has hundreds and hundreds of articles. We share it with anybody, doctors, patients, anybody, um, so that they get, and yeah. we also write letters to, and that's been, we advocate, we've been, had success both with insurance companies a lot and also with different governments around the world. Um, most recently in, in uh, Germany and in Poland where we, the tumor board, that's another function it serves. And this is supported by x -Cures. If we say, this is a group of experts in fibrolamellar, every single one has seen a minimum of 20 or 30 cases, many of us more than a hundred, and these are our recommendations based on our both our experience and our data that really can make the push the um, government sometimes if it's public and you know public insurance to do the treatment that we recommend. So we've been able to get treatments approved that would never otherwise never be approved. That's incredible. There's a lot of work to be done. Well, thank you, Dr. Ken. This was uh, truly riveting, and we hope to see more of you.